Okay. Hi, my name is Stefania Pieczonka and this is my story. Well, I was born in Poland and I had an older brother and myself, was just two of us, and mom and dad. And uh, we were born on a farm and my parents were farmers and we had a great life, great life. Uh, and uh, we grew up with uh, my cousins that live nearby and we always played together and school was uh, built just across our fence. My granddad gave property and they built the school. So everybody was extremely happy because their children didn't have to walk miles away to school, just, you know, in a neighbor. So I was about to start school a year ahead the, when war started, so I never went to school in Poland. And uh, 11 of February 1940, the German came, German, uh, up. that's not it. It's okay. Uh, Russian came and uh, took us to Siberia, whole families, whole villages, and uh, that was the end of our beautiful life in Poland. And uh, in Siberia, they put us in a camps, uh, deep, where it was so cold, and my father, mother, all the people that would work were forced laborers cutting trees and making, uh, building a rails. And how did you get to Siberia? You went by train. Yes, they so took us by train and they, it was long journey for three weeks, longer than three weeks. So because they didn't tell us not to take anything, because we're going where there's plenty of everything, so people were dying of starvation, especially little children, died by thousands before we reached rich Siberia. So that was horrible. And that how, how many people would be in one, tr in one car? In one car was about 60 people laying on like they make ba banks and they were laying like sardines one beside the other and it was and winter no, time winter time no toilets so they had to drill holes and people were shy about it so somebody would hold the blanket so they would do their own the thing but after nobody even pay attention because everybody was so sick that it was impossible even to do anything Occasionally, train would stop somewhere and they would give us boiled water and maybe soup that was made of fish. All you could see, like uh, ice fish floating on top but, of the soup. But people would eat that because it was nothing else, absolutely nothing else. And did you know where you were going and how long it would take? We didn't know how long it's going to take, but people knew where we were going because that didn't happen the first time during the first war before when Russian came they took people to Siberia to labor camps and that was the end of people. People mostly died there and never came out. So they knew more or less where they were going. But nobody knew for how long and how hard it's gonna be. So when we they we took we reached the place where we stayed. The barracks was built from logs and was one big uh, burner, wood burner, on the middle of it and was like uh, banks built all around. And the whole farm, they would put f whole family in that, like, I don't remember exactly how many people but it was like six families with children and uh, wives, husbands and grandmothers, whole families. And people that could work, they were forced to go miles and miles deep in the forest to cut the woods. And grandmas would look after youngsters and like myself, we went to a uh, 
Jet Sat. It's like kindergarten, but it's called Jet Sat. And that's where I was going. And older kids were going. And how old were you? I was six years old. And older, all older kids, when they were seven, they start grade one. Like they were going to school. But older kids, like 14, 15, they were forced to labor as well. So, um, in Jetsa, there were so many people, different ages, from diaper to grade six, and there was few people, few Russian women that took care of us. But at least they gave us a little soup to eat, because, like my grandmom, they didn't have anything. They were going, summertime, they were going to forest, pick up mushrooms and blackberry, blueberry, anything they could put their hands on. And they would dry that up for winter, so we would have some kind of a soup for winter. And they would try to <clears throat> plant some potatoes, but potatoes wouldn't grow. The winter was so long that the potatoes wouldn't get ready actually, so they did green potatoes, which is bad for you, but they would cook it anyways, so we had something to eat. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people died. A lot of people died. My uncle was six people, five people died, four kids, and my uncle, just my aunt, survived. My dad died, my little cousin died, my other aunt died, and my other cousin died. More than half of my family died in Siberia. And how did Jaju die? Jaju died in coming out of Siberia on a train. They were taking him off. My uh, uncle was carrying him on his back and he died in the morning, and the other Jajo died in the evening the same day. My Babcha died in Siberia. Most of the people died. Very few people came out of there. And how old was your Tata? My Tata was uh, 38 years old when he died. My uncle was 37 years old. My Chocha was 35 years old. You know, they were young people, and kids were small, mm -hmm. small kids. And uh, when amnesia came in 1942, like, because Stalin signed a pact with uh, Churchill, actually, because he thought he's going to lose war to Germans, so to beat the Germans, and uh, American came to war after Pearl Harbor, so they decide that they gonna join the war. So they came, joined the English army and Polish army formed, and um, French army as well. A lot of since uh, England has a lot of colony like uh, India. So there was a lot of uh, Hindu army form as well. And uh, they let us out because um, uh, General Sikorski formed Polish army. He promised Stalin he's going to form Polish army in Siberia, but it's not going to belong under Russian general. It's going to belong under his roof, under his. It's going to be his army, and he can take that army out of if it, out of Russia, if that's going to be the case, and that's what happened. So they announced that Polish people can go free at that time. So you were in Siberia for three years. Two years. Two years. Two. Years. And then people, not everybody heard about it because some places the camps were so deep, there was no radio, no way of communication, they never heard anything about it. So they stayed there till maybe some people stayed till today, I don't know. But a lot of people, like my mom, like our camp, you know, we start going uh, 
by all means, by boats, by donkeys, by trains, just to get away, we are going south through Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, just to get away from Siberia, from Russia. And uh, that was harsh, harsh journey because nobody had anything to eat. And how are you traveling? As I say, by donkeys, by trains, by any means, walking and anything. And finally we got to um, to the point where Polish army was forming and they start sort of like telling people just to form a telling people to form the camps, not to go, because people went crazy, because they were hungry, they were dying. And they tried to help them out because they had more food. So they tried to share with those people, with children, especially with children, but it wasn't enough to share it even, because it was thousands of people, thousands. It was packed with people, sick people, sick children. They didn't know what to do. So they start organizing uh, between themselves, between people more educated, uh, calling for doctors, for nurses, to help those people in any way. So after that, the, uh, my mom was very sick, so she was afraid she's gonna die. So she signed me to orphanage because my brother joined cadets and he wasn't old enough, but he told them he's 15, so just to get away. And soldiers were, were telling those youngsters, tell them you're 15, you're not 13, you're 15. Just join cadets, at least you're gonna have some food there. So that's what happened. And uh, I was in orphanage because my mom thought she's going to die. And in orphanage, somebody's going to take care of me. And I was there, I don't know for how long, because all I remember, I don't remember everything. I just don't. I know I, I was extremely sick. And they call blindness that evening came, I couldn't see anything, I couldn't walk because it's just, you blind, they call chicken blindness, you know, kusha slipotai. And um, my orphanage came to Tehran, it was thousands of children, and they formed three huge camps of orphanages, like, I don't know how many children was in one orphanage, and my mom didn't die. Thank God. And when she came to Tehran, and uh, by she was looking after me. And I was walking by the barber wire around the building, and I'm looking. I think that's my. Okay. In Kazakhstan, uh, everybody was so sick with. Um, oh gosh, just a minute. Um, with many diseases, with uh, diphtheria, with cholera. cholera. And <clears throat> first my mom was sick, she was in a hospital, then my brother, the last one I got sick. And at that point everybody was leaving, like going south, just, just leaving. Nobody looked after anybody, they just wanted to get away. So when I was in a sick bay, my mom came and she said, <clears throat> everybody left except me and you. So I got so scared she's going to leave me all by myself. So I said, oh, mom, please don't leave me. Just don't leave me here. And she says, no, I'll be back tomorrow. But she couldn't get in. It's just we talk by the window, like through the window. And uh, they were giving in a sick bay a piece of bread, a very small piece of dark bread, and a little tiny candies. They didn't have sugar. So <clears throat> I was so, so hungry, but I saved that piece of bread, and I lit candy, and I stuck in a bread. And I thought, when doctor's going to come, and I'm going to offer him such a big gift, 
it's going to let me go. So here he comes in the morning and I said, my mom came to pick me up and I'm afraid she's going to leave me so I would like to go and with my mom. So I'm going to give you that piece of bread with those beautiful candies. Can you let me go? So he says, child, eat that. That's for you. You're going to go to your mom. And I thought he's the best man in the whole wide world. Yeah. And mom came and picked me up that day. And um, yeah, and we left. I don't know what means. Maybe she carried me or something because I was extremely sick. And we got joined the others. I think by train, some, and some by Uzbekistan that some are kind, some are not, but some kind of people, they have a donkeys and carts, so they would give you a ride. So we go to the others and, yeah, and eventually my mom had to give me the orphanage anyways. So, that's this, you know, that's how it went. And uh, people die of starvation and today if somebody throws food out it just breaks my heart because they don't realize when you don't have nothing to eat and you, are, you just think about a piece of bread it's like the most treasure you ever had but you don't have that and you would give anything just anything for a little piece of bread so don't waste your food just Eat a little bit less and give that money to poor. You know, that's the best way. So then you're in the orphanage and then Babja showed up and so you were rejoined with her. Yeah. And then we stayed in Tehran. That was a camp that they were sorting people. Where were they going to take those people? And that was... Beginning of uh, 1943, we were there and um, we heard that uh, General Sikorsky was killed in Alger Algiers. Uh, in that um, Zatoka. Uh, he was flying to talk to uh, Stalin at that moment and the plane, they say it was sabotage and the plane crashed. He was with his daughter so he died and his daughter and the pilot jumped out and he never was killed. So it was sabotage. And I remember people crying because he took us from Siberia. He was a great, great man. You know, he cared for people, he cared for country. And uh, anyways, they separate us, they put us in different camps, and uh, after they took us to Karachi. Karachi at that time belonged to India. And in 1956, of course, the war between Pakistan and India, so now it belongs to Pakistan, but at that time it belonged to Karachi, to India. And we stayed in a camp there under the tent for two years, waiting where they're going to take us from there. So they, some people went to um, Mexico, and there was three big orphanages. So Canada took Montreal, the Bishop of Montreal took about 60 children, that's all. Mexico, such a poor country, they took the most orphan, you know, a lot of kids. A lot of kids went to New Zealand. New Zealand took it. Uh, some of them stay in Africa. Um, and the rest, I don't know. I don't think anybody else took those orphans. You know, and Poland was asking for those children, but the, at that time the government in exile in England didn't want 
to let those kids go because they knew it's all communist, so they didn't want those children to go to the communist country. So families were sort of uh, sorted out, some stayed in India, they make big camps because it belonged to, it was English colony, and since uh, uh, England has a lot of colonies in Africa, so a lot of people went to Africa, like myself and my mom, and there was a lot of uh, camps, I think about six or eight camps in Af through Africa, like North Rhodesia, South Rhodesia, you know, now it will call Zambia, Zambique, and all that, there were camps. Some camps, they have 5,000 people, some camps have 6,000 people. Uh, anyways, each camp, uh, they form schools, Polish schools for children, and all kind of um, things for people to do, like, take care of, um, they build kitchen, so they cook together, so people will go there and uh, take their meals, like breakfast, lunch, and supper. And some larger camps, they were giving uh, product so they can cook themselves. So they built small, um, like, firewoods outside, and they cook on it. So where did you end up? I went, I end up in North Rhodesia, Zambia. And how did you get there from Karachi? I got there, in, we got there by boat and then by train to destination where we live. It was near Ndola, it was just in a forest. They built little huts. It's a, within a, the dirt floor and it's just a square huts like a uh, smaller than double garage, much smaller than double garage, maybe larger than s single garage. Just, you can fit four beds, and that's about all, single beds. And we had uh, nets over our beds because the roof was with the banana leaves and a, and a straw, so a lot of termites would get there and would fall on you and all kind of different bugs. So we had to sleep under the nets. And um, that was our life actually in Africa. And I lived in Africa for four years, going to school there. And my mom worked in a hospital, you know, taking the meals to hospital, to the sick bay. It was a sick bay, not a big hospital. And we built a church, everybody went to church, you know, and... Um, so most people were quite healthy there. Yes. Oh, we had food, we had uh, corn meal every morning, which was great because, you know, you got sick of corn meal every morning, but still it was great. We had a dark bread with, you know, that ladies bake themselves. Every, everything was done by ladies. You know, they gave us uh, flour, sugar and everything and women would cook. And uh, what else do you want to know? And uh, my brother joined the cadets and he was in um, Palestine. Since, uh, he, because he was in cadet, so he belongs like, uh, we were army personnel. So when war ended, the Polish army went to England because they talked together. So they went to England. They didn't want to go back to Poland because whoever went back to Poland went to the... Uh, uh, prison? Prison. They went to prison and some went back to Siberia on top of it. That was awful. So they got the word out of Poland, so they stopped that. Because everybody wanted to go back because they had some had family, wives and children. But after that they just stopped it because they would, you know, die anyways. And 
Yeah, so we went to England in uh, 1947. By boat? By boat. It was... We went by train from... And then we went by boat. And so your brother was with you now? No, he was in England. We were going from Africa to England to join him. So we came to England in 1947 in May and I thought that was the most beautiful country because uh, you had beautiful houses and people were nice and gosh first time I saw white bread I thought I'm in heaven first time and that was something else England was poor because war hit them very hard and everything was on Russian even for English people, for everybody. So it wasn't, you know, that people had everything, but it was great, you know. We ate a lot of rabbits, a lot of rabbits, which was delicious. And I went to school there in England, in, to Polish school, of course. I don't know why, but they from Polish school again. And uh, then... Uh, I was waiting to go to school, to, to high school, because I missed a lot of schooling through the war. And, you know, I had to do some two, three grades in one year, which was so hard. How child that is not nourished well, you know, it was very, very hard. So, I went to work there. I went to pick up beets in the fall, potatoes to the farmers, all the young children uh, from the camp had to do that. And uh, I never went back to school after because at first I was too young, then I was too old and, you know, and I just was working so how much in the factories. Finish? I finished grade seven, seven and a half, almost eight. And where was Babcha working? Babcha was always working in a hospital for some reason, helping, uh, uh, washing the uniforms because nurses always uh, wear white uniforms at that point. And, or taking the food with the big buckets, you know, she was always working and she wasn't paid for it, she just worked. Nobody was paid. Everybody got 10 shillings a month. You know, so that's all she got, but she worked. And um, in a camp in England, they put us in a camp. After the army, there were half barracks uh, built from steel, like uh, half a barrel. And in the middle was a firewood, was uh, nothing there, it was very cold because uh, in England can be very cold, and especially when you don't have a good shelter. So, uh, I, you know, I got so frustrated at living in, in, in that condition, because Africa, at least it was warm, and here I'm freezing all the time, so... <laughs> On the other hand, you know, it's always something. But... I, my brother got married very young and he lived near Nottingham working in a mine. So I moved with my friend to Nottingham and actually I got a great job uh, with the baby wool and I was packing baby wool and by eight, um, 16 ounces, eight to the box, How eight balls to the box. I was 17. And when you, at that point I was 17, and when you're 17, you don't earn much money. You have to, it's like in stages, from 16 to 18. From 18 you earn a bit more money, till you're 21. When you're 21, you're an adult, you earn like an adult. So I would earn enough money to pay for hostel, and I never had nothing left over. So I decided I'm going to go to Nottingham, so I went to Nottingham. And I got my work on a piecework. And I made so much money because I was so fast that I was helping my mom. Actually, I was helping her 
buying eggs that was on ration and taking to the hostel a lot of things that she couldn't get I would buy and, and uh, just travel by bus every two weeks and get some things for her and uh, but after she was so lonely she says you're not gonna leave you have to come back to me but the hostel you know people were uh, working and they were joining their uh, children, their uh, sons, and they were buying houses. They were getting used to the life in England. And uh, the hostel was not very many people left, so they were putting people, getting people together with other Polish people hostels. So we moved to the Krushire, to another hostel. And um, I didn't know what to do with myself because my brother was married, my mom was nothing happening, so I decided to come to Canada. Since my cousin was in Canada, so I wrote her a letter asking that they can sponsor me. So of course we grew up together from, you know, Bronia, Checha Bronia, and she sponsored me and I came to Canada. When I came to Canada, I thought, my God, you know, it's like a, I mean, nowhere. Winnipeg was small, like a cowboy city. And but I was afraid. I was ashamed to ask my brother for money. I didn't have no means to go back to England. So I stayed and met my husband, and everything was fine after. You know, and I got used to it, and I'm glad I'm here. I've had a great life, and uh, that's how my life began in Winnipeg, meeting your Tata and just fell in love and got married and my mom came two, two weeks before our wedding from England. I wouldn't get married without her. So we pay her fare and she came. Tata was so good, he gave me some money because I didn't have money <laughs> to pay her coming. And uh, I felt sorry for my brother, very sorry that leaving him there. But, you know, I wanted a different life for me. Okay. Okay, that's my great-grandmom. That's my grandmother, actually. And that's uh, my mom's first cousin getting married. And that's my mom and my dad getting married in Poland. That's our school. That's our school. And that one is my mom and my little brother. Sweet. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. My mom and my brother Joseph. <laughs> and that one is very important. That one from Siberia, Jetsat, calls Jetsat, like a daycare, whatever. You want to see me? You want to point mm -hmm. where I am? Look at that edge That's me here, little head. <laughs> That's me. That's Stasha, my cousin. That one. That's my cousin. That's my cousin. Mostly it's family, you know. What else? And that is my uncle, my cousin, mom, and myself sitting. Uh, that was in later on in Tehran. Okay. And that one was already in uh, Karachi. And that's my brother in Cadets. He's uh, my brother in Cadets, and he's walking right here. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next. Oh, that's not. That's that's near near Tegatan. Doesn't. Well, I wanted to show you Tata family. Okay. And that's your. Who's that? Frana Gustafania Pichonka, your judge in Babcha. Okay. 
and that's your judge in the voice school, in the army. Okay. Important things. Okay. Oh gosh. Gosh, 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 gosh. That's Wuyek Gromek, Chochaniusia, in Africa, in Tangeru. See how small they are? That's how small I was. Mm -hmm. You know.